Okay, so uh, uh, let, me, let me refresh your memory about where I was uh, on Wednesday. I had just finished uh, discussing Alexander the Great's invasion of India. And you remember that I ended the class with reading, reading out excerpts from a recent interpretation uh, or a recent retelling of the encounter uh, between Alexander and a group of Indian uh, sadhus or fakirs, mendicants, uh, known as the gymnosophists, right? And, and one of the reasons I was interested in that is because it's, it's the first encounter, obviously, of India with the West, um, and it sets up a classic opposition, as I pointed out in my previous lecture, between the, the might of the armed conqueror uh, and the might of the intelligence of the spiritual warrior, if I may put it this way. This is how you might think of the gymnosophists in some ways, you know, right? Uh, the, the opposition between the overdressed, which is what Alexander is, he's a general, right, and he's got armor and everything, and those who are underdressed. The, the opposition between the flesh and the spirit, between materialism and spiritualism. And this is not to say that these are the inherent properties of the West. Materialism and spiritualism is an inherent property of India, not at all. That would be an orientalist kind of interpretation, right? But, but this is why this, why this particular narrative is of some importance. Uh, and then, as I pointed out to you, somewhere around 324, 323 BCE, uh, we're going to have Alexander is going to withdraw. He's going to withdraw from India. There's a, there's a mutiny of his troops. Uh, this, is, this is what Aryan records yeah, in his text. And, and eventually, they're going to, with, they're going to leave India, uh, the Greeks, but they're going to leave behind these military garrisons. And we're going to pick up the story from here. Now, uh, before I pick up the story, I want you to turn your attention to some of the slides that I want to show you, uh, just a few of the Buddha, and then I'm going to start discussing uh, Chandra Gupta Maurya and, the, uh, and uh, Ashoka. So if you, if you look over here, uh, what you have in this slide is, uh, you're going to see a lot more of this, by the way, in uh, maybe, maybe the following lecture or the lecture after that, you're going to see some representations of Buddha, which come from a place called Gandhara. Uh, which is in the northwest, right? Um, and so that's a very famous period of Indian sculpture. And when we spend a little bit more time on Indian art, architecture, and sculpture, we look at some representations of Buddha. But this is also from Gandhara. It shows the Pari Nirvana, the you know the the the, the, the Buddha going off to sleep finally, right? That, the end of his life, uh, surrounded by some of his disciples. You remember that I mentioned to you that there is a tradition. Uh, of showing the, the Buddha as uh, emaciated. This is when he became an ascetic, right? You recall that he had become an ascetic, and it's only after he had performed austerities for several years that he decided that, well, this was not really the path to enlightenment. Well, this is one representation. It's an extraordinary representation. You can see the eyes hollowed out. You can see the rib cage, right? Because he's been starving. He's, uh, he's been practicing austerities, and this is the, the larger sculpture uh, a similar one from which, uh, of which you had a close-up before. Now, uh, if you turn your attention to this particular slide over here, so this is a, uh, a representation of the spread of uh, Buddhism from India. So if you look at the, the middle of India there, it says Shakyamuni lives in the region of Magadha during the 6th, 5th centuries BCE. Uh, and then, you know, the arrows there show the spread of Buddhism to other parts uh, of the world. Uh, how and under what circumstances this happened is going to be apparent in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what we speak about when, when we think of the spread of Buddhism to other parts of India. So down south to Sri Lanka and obviously east uh, to uh, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, in fact actually to China and then all the way to, to Japan as well, and obviously south, large parts of Southeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia, uh, which you know comprises countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, it got all of its institutionalized religions, all of them, from India. All right? Beginning with Buddhism, Hinduism, and even Islam. I mean, if you go to Indonesia today, Indonesia is predominantly Muslim. Uh, Java is almost entirely Muslim. Bali, of course, is still the last Hindu outpost there. Uh, their Hinduism is very different. But the point here is that all of Southeast Asia essentially gets all of its, what we might describe as institutionalized religions, really the three major religions that have been predominant there at some point or another, uh, all of them come from India, right? So the links between India and Southeast Asia 
are going to be important to understand at some point. But, but uh, in some ways, Buddhism is the beginning of those links. People going from India carrying Buddhism to these parts of the world. And here you've got a map here, the spread of Buddhism, again a different rendition, but now it gives, you get a slightly different sense of how this worked out. So, and you can see the, the, uh, the nodal point in India is slightly towards the east because that's where Magadha was, right? This is where Patliputra or modern day Patna in the eastern part of the Gangetic Plains and then from there the transmission of Buddhism to other parts of the world. Now, I would like you to look at this map a bit uh, and I'm going to explain because this, this uh, uh, takes us into the next chapter now, which is the establishment of the Mauryan Empire. Okay, the first great empire that you're going to find, which is going to have the unique distinction in a way. This is one way to understand the Mauryan Empire. I don't think it's actually been really understood in that way as such, but it's, it's the first empire that brings together the Indus and the Ganga together. Okay, so the Indus was the, the site of the earlier Harappan civilization, the Indus and its tributaries, and then we get into the Gangetic Plains, right, which is where we're going to find the spread of Buddhism and all of that, and we know that the Aryans had migrated eastward, right, into modern day UP, Bihar, those areas, right, which is along the Gangetic Plains there, right. So one of the unique distinctions of the Mauryan Empire is that it is in fact actually going to, as I said, bring together the, the Ganga and the Indus. That's one way to understand it, right? Now, who was Chandragupta Maurya? What do we know about him? Well, Chandragupta Maurya is a young man who, uh, at least that's, that's what the, you know, the, the histories tell us. Uh, essentially, uh, most likely, I mean, we don't know this with absolute certainty, most likely he actually encountered Alexander when Alexander was there. And the argument is that perhaps having seen how Alexander had been able to put together an empire there, he realized that perhaps he could do the same thing. And when, when the Greeks are going to leave, when Alexander is going to leave, and he's going to leave behind these garrisons, as I pointed out to you, right? Uh, uh, what Chandragupta Maurya is going to do is that he's actually going to, in a few years, take possession of these, right? Uh, our source for this, by the way, is a Greek diplomat, uh, Megasthenes, right? He's, he's the major source that we have for what's happening roughly around this period of time. We do have another source. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and that is a source uh, by a, a man called Kotilya, also known as Chanakya. So he knows, goes by two different names. And he writes a book called the Arthashastra. Okay. Now, so we, so this is one source that we have. It's not a source so much on um, uh, the history of Chandragupta Maurya. It's a source on what was happening in the empire. How was the empire put together? What were the kinds of responsibilities that the emperor had? Right. What were the weights and measures? How many stables? did the emperor have? How many war elephants did he have? Right? What kind of uh, uh, laws pertained right, in this area? Okay? What kind of espionage services? And there is. I mean, so in fact, Chanakya is very often, or Kautelya is, as he's known, he's very often known as the Machiavelli of the East. Of course, you might want to ask why Machiavelli is not known as the Chanakya of the West, because, of course, Chanakya or Kautelya comes 1500 years before Machiavelli, right? Well, even more than 1500 years before Machiavelli, but that's typically how it's done in this scholarship, right? So he's the Machiavelli of the East. And for those, those of you who know who Machiavelli is, you would immediately recognize that Machiavelli is supposed to be the, the person who, you know, he wrote a book called The Prince, right? Which is a kind of a manual, if I may put it this way, right? On how to govern and how to govern using spies, you, you know, using intrigue and diplomacy, setting one person off against another, right? This is who Kotelya is. He is the chief minister to this person called Chandragupta Maurya, right? Who is going to put together this empire. So if you look at this slide over here, uh, 305 BCE, that's the, the portion in blue. Now that to the west is Afghanistan, modern day Afghanistan. Right? Uh, Hindu Kush mountains on top of that, that's modern day Afghanistan. And he's come, he's extended his empire all the way east into modern day Bengal, portions of modern day Bengal. Right? That's, that's what this slide is showing. So Chandragupta Maurya is going to capture Taxila, which is in the northwest. 
This is where that great university had been set up, which, to which I had made some reference uh, in my previous lecture in 317 BCE. Uh, and sometime around 303 BCE, he is going to essentially gain control of larger chunks of this territory and establish what becomes known as the first great, as I said, Indian Empire. Uh, Chandragupta Maurya, if you're looking, at, by the way, at earlier sources, I mean, in Greek sources, he's known as Sandrakotas. That's the name by which he's known in the Greek uh, uh, sources. All right. Uh, and uh, uh, south, down south, actually, the empire is going to extend to the river Narmada. I, I think the next slide might show that. Yes, so you see the river Narmada over there in the middle. And the empire, the Mauryan empire under Chandragupta Maurya is going to extend there. It's going to, under Ashoka, it's going to extend much further south, uh, as we shall soon find out. Right? Now, Chandragupta Maurya is going to have a reasonably long reign. And as I said, we have a reasonably good estimation okay, of what was happening in his kingdom, how it was organized. And the reason for that is the Artha Shastra. So Artha... You remember the four ends of life, right? So artha is material wealth. Shastra means science, okay? So it's the science of material wealth, if you want to translate really literally, but what it is really is a huge compendium. The English translation runs into four or 500 pages, all right? Uh, the earliest manuscripts, I want to reiterate this yet again, and I will probably reiterate this 10 more times during the course of the next few weeks. The earliest manuscripts do not go back to 300 BCE. The earliest manuscripts are later written manuscripts because this text, like all other Indian texts of this kind, is essentially passed down in the oral tradition. Right? There are also lots of speculations as to why, I mean, it could have been that some of these texts, and this would be a markedly secular text, as opposed to, let's say, something like the Vedas or the Upanishads. There's some speculation as to why you know, uh, the, uh, uh, there are no manuscripts that survive from that period of time. Is it simply because texts were passed down in the oral tradition, or does it have something to do with the climate of India as well, right? Hot tropical climate, right? Well, how do you preserve manuscripts that go back, you know, this far back in time, right? Uh, that's a consideration that, that always comes up. Um, the, the important point, nevertheless, for us is to simply try to understand what the Artha Shastra is about. I've given you a very broad kind of idea, and if you read Nehru's Discovery of India, uh, he has, in fact, actually a description of the text to some degree, right? So as I said, it gives you a sense of the political organization of the state, okay? It gives you a sense of the kind of administrative structure. What were the different functionaries of the state? What were the different departments of the state, right? Uh, so how would you distinguish the revenue and the agricultural departments from the finance departments, from the war department, right? What was a kind of council, if I may put it this way, of ministers that he had put together? But then from there it moves on to a great many other kinds of things, right? Because if you think of a state, you have to think of many things. How, how does the state control the sale and purchase of goods? How does it collect taxes, right? You go and buy something, well, there has to be some kind of uniform measure, right? And what were these measures that were used, right? So this is what the Artha Shastra is going to, in fact, elaborate at very great detail. It's going to give us a full, a fairly fulsome picture of the material conditions of the domains of Chandragupta Maurya. Right? And, in, and to that extent, it is a absolutely indispensable source. Nothing like that that we're going to get in India again for a very long period of time. Now, Chandragupta Maurya uh, is going to, towards the end of his life, and this is again extraordinary, because you're going to find that he, his son, and his grandson are going to represent the three greatest faiths in India now at that time. This is, of course, long before the coming of Islam. I mean, Islam is going to come much later on. And what do I mean by that? Chandragupta Maurya, towards the end of his life, three or four years before he dies, he decides to abdicate in favor of his son, Bindusara, right? So his son is Bindusara, and he decides to abdicate his throne. He gives up his throne, um, and he embraces Jainism, and eventually travels far down south, Okay, so down to the Deccan, below the Narmada, right, where he's going to eventually fast 
unto death. He's going to starve himself to death. This is a Jain tradition as well, particularly among Jain spiritual teachers and monks, that you, when you, that towards the very end you abandon your body by starving to death. Okay, There's a, it's a particular mode in which you do this, and this is what he's going to do. So he's he's a Jain. His son, Bindusara, is going to remain firmly committed to Hinduism. But remember, Hinduism is really Brahminism at this point. There is no such thing called Hinduism. Right? And then, of course, Bindusara's son, Ashoka, is going to convert to Buddhism. So this is what I mean when I say that the three generations of this family uh, right, represent the three different faiths. Right? But let's go back to Bindusara, his son now. So his son inherits the throne. We don't really know much about him. I mean, he's sort of like the, the, in a way, we know his name, we know a little bit about him, but he's sort of like the missing link between Chandragupta Maurya and Chandragupta Maurya's grandson, Ashoka. Right? What we do know is that Bindusara extended his father's empire a little bit further south, okay, a little bit further south and a little bit into central India, a little bit more into eastern India as well. Right? Now Ashoka is going to come to the throne circa 273, approximately 273 BCE, he's going to have a very long reign, 41 years. Okay, and then again we have slightly precise dates for this, and and we have precise dates because as as I'm going to point out now that there are inscriptions that have been left behind which give us a pretty good idea what was happening in Ashoka's period of time. So he reigns from 273 to 232 BCE. Um, now Ashoka, in the first 10, 15 years, is going to have a reputation as a bloodthirsty warrior. Right? He's going to extend the kingdom further east. So now if you look at that sort of purple color, okay, and the key there says 250 CBC, Ashoka's Mauryan Empire, you can see he's more than doubled the size of the empire. It's gone much further down south, okay, much further below the Deccan, hasn't quite reached right, sort of the heart of the Tamil country at this point in time. Tamil country is down that further south. That'll, that'll, Right? But extends all the way to obviously south and western India, right? And then the portions of what today would be called modern day Gujarat and all the way up till Orissa, modern day Orissa, right? So this place further east, if you look where the Bay of Bengal is, so right on top of that, the purple portion over there, uh, this is the area that today is called Orissa and in Ashoka's time was known as Kalinga. So 10, 15 years after Ashoka comes to power, he wages an intense battle in Kalinga. And there, there are descriptions of this battle. Uh, some of the descriptions have been left behind by Ashoka himself. Because at the end of it, I mean, it's a bloodbath. Tens of thousands of people killed, right? And he's acquired absolute mastery over this domain. But it's a bloodbath and he's filled with remorse at the end of it. Right? And this is going to lead to his conversion to Buddhism. Right? So now his father, of course, as I said, was remained a Hindu and his grandfather had converted to Jainism. The, Ashoka himself is actually going to convert to Buddhism. And we have a very good record of how he operated over the course of the next 20, 25 years, partly because he left behind edicts. So edicts are like pronouncements, written you know, texts. Right, R carved into stone. Right now, I'm going to show you some of these uh, pillars and edicts. Uh, mainly pillars, I'm going to show you over here. So these pillars are um, something on the order of let's say 20, 25 feet high. Okay, G made of granite. Right, sometimes very polished stone. And then on top of that, you might have uh, a number of animals there. In fact, the national emblem of India is taken from one of the Ashokan pillars. And these pillars and edicts are going to be spread nearly throughout the kingdom. Nearly throughout the kingdom. Which gives you a very good idea of the extent of the extent of his kingdom. So if you look at this map over here now, so this is uh, another rendition. Uh, and, and the Chola Pandya country, that's the Tamil country. Uh, we'll come to that later on when I, when I turn my attention to South India. But here you have a pretty good sense. And Gandhara, Texila, if you look on the, on the top, so Texila is a university where there was a university where, as I mentioned to you, 
there are people who had come all the way from Iran, Central Asia, Turkey, you know, the, the area west of India. And Gandhara is where a school of sculpture is going to develop, a very, very significant school of sculpture, right? Patliputra, Magadha to the east, right? And then Kalinga before that, just, under, just below that, this is modern day Orissa. This is where you have the Battle of Kalinga, where Ashoka is going to establish his mastery. These, little, these sculptures that you see, these are from a museum in Paris. Uh, these are uh, uh, sculptures from the Mauryan period. So the early Mauryan period, um, and I want you to just uh, think of the contrast, just try to remember what they look like here. You can see that at this time the sense of proportion is not that well developed uh, because the difference between this and Gandhara sculpture uh, a few centuries later is just absolutely enormous, right? Uh, now this is an Ashokan pillar. Okay, so this still stands, by the way, this is, a, this is a contemporary photograph, not taken by myself, it's taken from the internet, uh, and you s see the single-faced, uh, a single lion on the, on the top, uh, and here you get a, 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 an idea of the larger sort of, sort of backdrop to that, so that's the, that's the pillar there, and then you have a stupa, and now you have a close-up of the representation of the lion over here, on, on the pillar itself is where you're going to find the inscriptions, okay? And what is it that the inscription says? There are various rock edicts as well. So this is, by the way, uh, one of the, this is a close-up of what you find on top of the pillar in Sarnath. So Sarnath is where the Buddha delivered his first sermon, as you might remember, right? Okay, and this is now the national emblem. This has been taken as a national emblem uh, in India, all right? What is it that the inscriptions and the edicts say? Right? Number of different things. One, a remarkable testimony to Ashoka's ecumenism. Okay? And you can read the text of some of these very briefly in the pages that have been assigned to you from the discovery of India. So I'm not going to repeat what Nehru says over there. Okay? But if you read it, you will get a very good idea of what I mean when I speak about the religious ecumenism because Ashoka says very clearly that that his subjects are free to practice whatever religion pleases them, whatever religion they want to profess, right? That they shall have the liberty to do so. And of course, we have to think as to how this climate of religious tolerance arose. Now, was this because of the nature of Buddhism? Uh, is it because, in some sense of the term, if you look at Hinduism, right? which is the backdrop to Buddhism, right? B Buddhism is emerging out of that. That Hinduism doesn't have a single historical founder. It doesn't have a single historical text, right? That every Hindu is enjoined to, to follow, right? Could, be, could these be some of the things that contributed? Or was it the character of Ashoka that contributed to this kind of religious tolerance and ecumenism? But the edicts are very clear about that, right? And then... The edicts also specify what are the kinds of things that are not to be done. So, for example, Ashoka forbid the slaughter of animals. And some of the edicts say that very clearly. Some of the inscriptions point that out. The, the, the inscriptions, by the way, are, many of them are in Prakrit. Some of you might wonder what language they are in, right? They're in, they're in Prakrit, which can be described in some ways as the vernacular tongues. Okay, so this is the, so now we're moving away from Sanskrit to some degree. The script is this, what is called the Brahmi script. Some of them are actually written in another script as well. Um, there's also a couple of edicts, incidentally, written in Greek and Aramaic. Okay, one written only in Greek, one written in Greek and Aramaic, and that's more towards the Northwest. Um, there is a, I want to show you a slide here which shows you the extent of the, uh, so if you look at this, uh, map over here, and if you look at the, the squares there as it points out, major rock edicts, you can see spread out over a very large part, including one in Kandahar, which many of you have heard of uh, since uh, that's one of the sites of the insurrection in, in Afghanistan, right? And then if you look at the, the, the small triangles there, this is where the pillar, the pillar edicts are. So this is where the pillars are. The rock edicts are where you simply have a boulder and then on the boulder they have actually carved out something, right? Okay, uh, this is, and this is what I mean when I said that 
that the that the spread is actually enormous, right? Which suggests a the extent of Ashoka's empire, and of course suggests the extent to which Buddhism might have now started to proliferate throughout the kingdom. Yes. Could you repeat the question again? Oh, like, how, like, were people able to, like, did people, like, actually read them in the communities? Were they... Were they oh, well, people? you know, look, we don't, we don't know to what extent, okay, people might have been able to follow the script. But, I mean, but, like, but that's why they're written in Prakrit. Prakrit would be the vernacular, right? The vernacular, yeah. No, no, but that's only going to be... The, you remember I said only a couple. You, we're, talking about, we're talking about edicts and pillars that are spread throughout the country. You're not going to find the ones written in Greek down further down south. You're going to find them in the northwest, right? Because this is where there had been a presence. And there's going to be an Indo-Greek kind of kingdom that's going to develop, the Bact Bactrian Greco kingdom, as it's called, shortly after the demise of the Mauryan Empire. Right? So that's, you're going to find that in the northwest. You're not going to find those written, in, you know, the one written in Greek, you're not going to find it down south or further east. I mean, those are going to be written in, in Prakrit, which is going to be the local or the, you know, the vernacular, if you want to call it. There are different kinds of Prakrit. Prakrit is not one single language, right? So the rough translation is the spoken tongue, right? The spoken tongue, the vernacular, right? And, that, and then the Prakrits might be different kinds of Prakrits. So the Jains, you know, would write their manuscripts. Uh, one of the slides that I have over here, um, let me just turn to it just for a moment. This one over here, okay? So this is a Jaina manuscript, Okay, this manuscript actually dates to 1500, right? But the internal dating of when this first arose dates it back to about 4th century BCE. Not the manuscript, it's not this particular manuscript, but, but it was copied from other okay, manuscripts, which eventually would have gone back to 4th century BCE. This is a Jaina manuscript, and this is a Prakrit here. Okay, it looks quite like Sanskrit, but it's quite different actually. Right? So this is a Jaina Prakrit, which is a, the, the, lo, the language in which the Jaina wrote their manuscripts. You see Mahavir over there, and then there's Gautama, which is not really the Buddha here, but it's translated as the Buddha, one of his followers. Uh, this manuscript uh, is, by the way, the cloth is made of gold, uh, and there's lapis lazuli around it, which suggests the enormous affluence of the Jaina community, that they were able to produce manuscripts of this kind, uh, roughly around 1500 AD. I'm showing this uh, slide to you at this point in time because this is written in a Prakrit, which is what I'm trying to describe is one of the vernaculars in which these edicts would have been written. But the question there is a good one in the sense that we have to think about, okay, so he wrote, these, these edicts were inscribed by his command, by Ashoka's command. The question is to what extent were people able to follow them, right? And we really can't say much about that. We don't know what the levels of literacy were, for example, at that point in time. There's just simply no way to gauge that, right? Okay, so, so uh, the, the, uh, the, what you should bear in mind is, obviously, what is the content of these edicts, right? And as I've mentioned to you, many of these edicts essentially promulgate Ashoka's orders, his wishes, his desires, right? So, for example, what he says about religious tolerance what he says about forbidding the slaughter of animals. And where does this idea come, forbidding the slaughter of animals, the idea of ahimsa, which I've already spoken to you about. Right? And it's going to be again carried forward much later on in the 20th century when Gandhi is going to create a whole political ideology, if we want to call it that, out of the idea of nonviolence, including the idea of mass nonviolent resistance. Right? But I think if you, if you read the texts that have been assigned to you, particularly the Nehru's, uh, discovery of India, I think you get a reasonably good sense. Now, the other reason why Ashoka is important, right? So one, he consolidates the empire and doesn't, just doesn't simply consolidate it. In fact, he extends the empire and creates what you have is the largest Indian empire up till this point in time. It's probably going to be another, you know, let's say close to 1800 years before you are going to get an Indian empire which is, going to extend, which is going to extend as far as Ashoka's empire. Right? Because the political history of India 
after this is going to be much more fragmented. And especially as we move into the demise of the Mauryan Empire, uh, so roughly 200 BCE, and move into that from that period all the way until 200, 300 AD, you're going to find that there's going to be enormous political fragmentation. Right? Well, there will be some distinct empires, kingdoms, but enormous political fragmentation. And it's not until we get to the Mughals much later on in the 16th century and get to Akbar that we're going to get an empire uh, of this particular magnitude. So that's one, one singular importance, right? Uh, because many people, and you might say, well, why is that important in itself? Well, it may be important in itself because some people are constantly thinking about a question that has crossed the minds of Indians for centuries and certainly crossed the mind of the British. Was there ever any kind of political unity in this place that we call India? Right? Because when the British come to India, they're going to take the view that there is no such thing really. What you have is you've got these different kinds of kingdoms. What puts, what gels here? What makes all of the people living in this landmass, right? Indians, right? Was there some conception of unity? What is it that brought about the unity? Because for example, let's say in the case of just, hype, just as an illustration, you say in the, in the case of Islam, what brings together this unity is the idea that all Muslims right, believe in Allah, believe in the fact that Muhammad is his prophet, right, his messenger, and then the Quran is the authoritative text. Now, there may be different interpretations, obviously, but it's the authoritative text. And then you have what are called the Hadiths, which are the, you know, the subsidiary sayings, you might put it this way, which are authoritative as well, to a great measure, right? right? And then there is this idea of a worldwide Muslim community, the Ummah. Now, what is it that brings together this unity in India? So this is why the idea of a Mauryan empire, which furnishes a certain kind of unity, becomes important, especially in nationalist narratives, that there always was, in fact, actually a great glorious past, right? I'm less interested in that. What I'm interested in is the personality of Ashoka. I mean, and he's clearly quite progressive. A quite might be an understatement. Not just relative to his times, but relative even to modern times, you might say. Because if in fact he was a practitioner of Ahimsa, right, uh, and converts to Buddhism and then seriously takes forward this idea that there has to be some kind of religious ecumenism in a polity that people should be able to practice the religion of their choice, well, this idea has its antecedents in Ashoka's thinking. But he's also significant for other reasons, beyond the ones that I've already mentioned. He is also going to, in fact, help in the institutionalization of Buddhism, the spread of Buddhism. Right, so the maps that, the, that you saw earlier on now, a few minutes ago, which show the spread of Buddhism, well, how did it happen? It happened because Ashoka sent emissaries. In fact, he sent emissaries as far west as Greece itself. And there's a very interesting thing, that one of the edicts actually mentions that the Greek word is 600 yojanas away. Okay, yojana. Yojana is a measurement. One yojana is equivalent to approximately seven miles. And so this edict mentions that Ashoka is sending his emissaries to Sri Lanka, further west to Greece, okay? And it says that the distance is 600 yojanas. So if you multiply 600 by seven, because one yojana is seven miles, that's 4,200 miles. That's roughly the distance, by the way, between India, the center of India and Greece. 4,000, 4,100 miles. So fairly accurate, okay? Fairly accurate measurement here of how far this place was. And of course, an emissary is further east as well, right? And he's going to convene a Buddhist council at Patna, Ashoka. Why does he convene a Buddhist council? Because now is going to be the time to start to standardize some of the teachings, right? I mean, this is the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha himself, of course, did not write anything, right? He did not write anything. I mean, what he says is recorded by people, by his disciples, and attributed to him, right? It's a little bit like Christ, of course. You have to go to the Synoptic Gospels, right? Okay? You go to Mark, Matthew, Luke, 
And then you say, all right, and then these are the words, these are the teachings that are attributed to Christ. So these are the teachings that are attributed to the Buddha, and then they are going to be recorded in the oral tradition, and then they have to be standardized because differences are going to arise among the disciples and among the interpreters. Remember, this is already now a couple of hundred years after the death of the Buddha, right? And of course, memory is deceptive and hazy, and people will manipulate it. So this is one of the things that uh, Ashoka is interested in doing. He's interested in trying to put together some kind of corpus that is going to become somewhat authoritative. All right. And as I said, Ashoka is going to rule until 232 BCE. Uh, what happens to the Mauryan Empire after that is a narrative that we're going to take up later on because I want to turn my attention to some other developments uh, before we do that. Uh, let me just make sure that I've shown you whatever I needed to show you over here. So the, uh, the pillars, uh, the, this is the Prakrit, and then uh, this, this, this slide here shows you, uh, gives you now a different representation. So now we come back, because now we're, you know, we're talking about Ashoka here, uh, to the spread of Buddhism. And again, you see that the central point is in India, and from there, it's going to radiate outwards to Sri Lanka, as I said, uh, Thailand, Khmer, you know, modern day Cambodia, all of that, and China, and again further north as well to, for example, uh, just south of modern day Mongolia, right? Uh, and this is the spread of the territory. So we're going to stop over here as far as this goes. I want to now turn my attention to other developments, because one of the things that we are interested in is what's happening in South India, right? Uh, South India does not receive much attention in most of the histories that you have uh, of India. Uh, the bulk of the histories tend to be concentrated uh, on, uh, obviously, uh, what is happening in the north and the northwest in that entire region, right? Where the great Mauryan Empire, as I said, is going to be eventually established. And before that, of course, you have the coming of the Aryans, you've got the Indus Valley. Again, all the outposts of that are further up north, right? either the north or northwest. Right? So let's just turn our attention momentarily. If you remember from this, one of the slides that you saw that the, even, the, uh, even uh, Ashoka's empire did not extend all the way to this ex the southern extremities. Okay? There's, there's, you, you still have a portion there which remains outside uh, his empire. What do we know about what's happening in, in, in South India? and particularly in what might be described as the Tamil country. Uh, okay. uh, what's happening in the Tamil country in prehistoric times is not something that I'm going to move into right now. I just want to spend a few minutes speaking about what happens r roughly around the time that Ashoka himself is engaging in his activities in northern and central India. Right? Because by 300 BCE, the Tamil presence is reasonably well certified or attested to, okay? well established by roughly around 300 BCE. Okay? The word Tamil itself, uh, there are variations of that word. Uh, uh, sometimes it appears as Damil or Damila or Damela, right? And these are all variations of that word. Uh, we know that the presence of the Tamil people is well established because there are various kinds of inscriptions. Some of these inscriptions have been found uh, in places like Andhra Pradesh. So Andhra Pradesh is one of the southern states in Nagarjun Kond. All right? uh, but their inscriptions spread throughout South India which seem to suggest the presence of a group of people that we might describe as Tamil people. Right? The most popular deity, and you're not going to find the deity mentioned in this, in this sketch that I have here. I, I'm not sure I'm going to get to this, so you might want to copy it down incidentally. Uh, but uh, the most popular deity would have been a deity called Murugan, okay? uh, also known as Kartikya, who is the son of Shiva. Right? So let me for a second just momentarily turn to this diagram over here so that you at least know what this means here. So in classical Hinduism, right? and let's just pause for a second here now. How did we get to classical Hinduism? So we start with the Vedas, then we move to the Upanishads. And from the Upanishads, we move to the Shramanic religions or the heterodox religions, right? As they're known in English. And that would include Buddhism and Jainism 
And then there are these materialist schools that we haven't spent much time on, right? right? And eventually, this is going to pave the way for what we might describe as classical Hinduism, which is several centuries in the making. You could say that the sort of this structure that I've described on the board here, that is the idea of the three murti. Three murti means, okay, the three main gods. And again, main has to be put in quotation marks because this is one of those anomalies of Hinduism that you're going to find. These three main gods supposedly are Brahma. Uh, in parentheses, I've written Saraswati. That's the consort, right? Or the wife, the spouse of the god. Okay, so his, his uh, Brahma's spouse is Saraswati, his consort is Saraswati. Um, uh, Saraswati is the, uh, the uh, goddess of learning and wisdom. Okay, Brahma is the creator. Vishnu is the preserver. So he's usually put in the middle and then you have Shiva who is the destroyer. So this idea is that you, that, you know, we go through this cycle in nature, don't we? Things are created. It's like nature, right? Nature rejuvenates itself. So trees shed their leaves, right? The winter comes, and then again there's the spring, and they blossom once again, right? So you've got preservation, destruction, and creation. Now when I said the three main gods, and I said something to the, to the extent that, Ah, there's a little something anomalous here. What is the thing that is anomalous? These are supposed to be the three main gods of Hinduism. Well, one interesting thing is Brahma is going to completely disappear. Completely disappear. I mean, of the tens and hundreds of thousands of temples to be found in India, there's only one temple dedicated to Brahma. And that's in a place called Pushkar in western India, in Rajasthan. And there are a lot of theories about why that might be the case. My pet theory, in any case, and I think I've mentioned that in the book, is that uh, there's something eminently practical about it. Well, the God of creation has done his work. You don't really need him anymore, so let's get him out of the picture completely. You know, and There is no temple, really, to Brahma. And you don't really see too many sculptural representations of Brahma either. Okay? And as I said, in parentheses are the consorts. Uh, again, this is a very complicated matter because... There are many different ways in which you can show the gods, okay? And you will have to think of the iconography. Uh, for those of you who are students of history or of art or you know something about Christian art, you know, think of the iconography of the saints in the Christian tradition, right? That th there are certain ways in which, how do you distinguish, okay, J Jerome from Sebastian? Saint Jerome from Saint Sebastian, from Saint Paul, from Saint Peter. How do you distinguish all of them? I mean, if you just see these saints there and you see a halo around the head, well, they all have a halo, so that's not going to help you. But there is another iconography. So Saint Jerome will often be shown with a lion seated next to him. Saint Sebastian is shown with spears through his chest. Okay, that's the iconography. Now there is a specific, a specific iconography for these gods and for the goddesses, their consorts. Um, and sometimes it's going to become more complicated because one of the ways in which you show Shiva, I'm just going to mention that right now, and then there'll be various times during the course of the next week or two when I'm going to allude to this again, and I'm going to interpret it. But let me mention what I mean when I say that there might be complications in how one begins to look at this. Shiva is very often shown as Earth Nari Ishwara, okay, which means Earth, Earth is half. Nari is woman. And Ishwara is God. Earth, Nari, Ishwara. So Shiva might be shown as half male, half female. Right? So one half of his body he's shown with long hair. The other half he's shown okay, with short hair. One half he's shown with breast. The other half without. Right? So forth and so on. Right? And, and of course, one of the things that this iconography is suggesting is that perhaps we should rethink our idea of what we mean by male and female. We should also think about the fact that gods, male gods, might have some feminine attributes. 
right? That's a possibility. And goddesses might possibly have some male attributes. Now, one of the reasons why you're reading the Hindu myths is because I want to suggest to you that there is a continuum between the gods. And here when I say gods, I include goddesses here as well. Okay? I don't want to make it cumbersome by saying gods and goddesses all the time. But let's say deities. Okay? There is a continuum between gods and humans. Gods are constantly tempted by humans. Humans may sometimes show the attributes of gods. Right? There isn't a hard and fast distinction between gods and humans. Not in this world that is going to be created, which I'm beginning to describe to you as classical Hinduism. Now, we got off on this because I was starting to talk about South India. So we're going to keep, you have to keep these two trajectories in mind. So one is what is happening in South India. Okay. And the other is what is the nature of this thing called Hinduism that is now beginning to emerge in India short you know, somewhere roughly around 200 BCE, but gets really consolidated into its classical form somewhere around the first century of the Christian era. So you've got this three murti, right? The three major gods, and many of the myths that you're reading are myths related to obviously Shiva, Vishnu, or other characters, right? Just give me two more minutes. One thing you have to bear in mind, now, is that Shiva does not have avatars, okay? And for those of you who are starting to worry about all of these names on the board, let me assure you, you're not going to get tested. I'm not going to give you a question and say, who's Matsya? Okay, don't worry about that. This, it just said, you, you need to know this in order to understand, okay, what these Hindu myths are about and why they are important and why you should be reading them, right? Now, Shiva does not have avatars. What is an avatar? An avatar is an incarnation. What is an incarnation? Because that's not self-evident, right? You simply translate it into English. An incarnation is when God comes down in the form of usually a human, not always a human. So the ten incarnations of Vishnu there begins with the kurma. Kurma is a tortoise. Then you get matsya. Matsya is a fish. Vamana is the dwarf, Varha is the boar, Narasimha, and I'm going to talk about, so read that myth, the myth of Narasimha. I'm going to talk about it at some length in my next lecture, half man, half lion. Here you see again the continuum, okay? And then you move into Balaram, and then of course the two main avatars who are the bedrock of Hindu mythology today, much of the bedrock of Hindu mythology today. Rama, that's the character of the Ramayana. That's why you need to know this now, because where did Rama come from? Right? Okay, and Krishna, who's going to be one of the main characters, obviously, of the, the Mahabharata, the other great epic that you're going to read. So, final thought, and then we'll turn to this on Friday. What is an avatar? An incarnation that comes down to this earth to save the world from wickedness. Okay, God sends down an incarnation when things begin to get a little bit murky, morally. Right? That's what you have to bear in mind. So we'll continue this narrative on Friday.